Whoa, 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 Mr. Tran here with another chemistry video. Today, we are going to be learning about acids and bases and their properties. So let's dive right in. If you don't have your graphic organizer out, be sure to get it out so we can start. We're going to start at the top left hand side of your graphic organizer. The box should say properties of acids and bases. We're going to start by listing properties of acids first. I would suggest either a bulleted list or a numbered list of properties. Your choice. I prefer bullets. First, acids are compounds that produce hydrogen ions when dissolved in water. So I would suggest putting a little bullet point underneath acids on the left hand side of your box and write down produces hydrogen ions when dissolved in water. Now, what exactly does that mean? Let's illustrate this with a common example. A really common acid that many of you have heard of is hydrochloric acid. That's HCl. Hydrochloric acid is found in your stomach. It is an acid that your body uses to dissolve or break down the foods that you consume. The formula for hydrochloric acid is HCl. Now, what do we mean by an acid is a compound that produces hydrogen ions when dissolved in water? Well, water will come in and break this molecule apart into its building blocks. Uh, this hydrochloric acid, when it dissolves, will form hydrogen ions so H plus and chloride ions, Cl minus. Now, what we are most concerned with are those hydrogen ions. Our definition for acids are compounds that produce hydrogen ions when dissolved in water. And I would definitely also write this formula underneath that statement to help you remember that means acid, again, when you add them to water, will dissolve and release hydrogen ions. H plus is another good way to remember or identify acids. They typically start with the letter H when you look at their chemical formulas. Examples of acids are vinegar, and vinegar is simply acetic acid. I'm not going to recommend that you write these down just because of spacing, but I did want you to know some examples. Another example would be lemon juice. Lemon juice is simply citric acid. Tea is another example. Tea is considered to be tannic acid. And last but not least, we have ant venom, the thing that hurts, and that is considered to be formic acid. Let's continue with our properties. The second bullet is sour taste. Uh, think about when you put that lemon in your mouth and that face you make. It's that reaction to the sour taste that acids have. The third defining property of acids is that they are corrosive. And another way to think about corrosive is that it means damaging. If you have living tissues, uh, it will damage that living tissue and it will break it apart or break it down. If acid is reacting with a non-living thing, corrosive means that it will damage or destroy other chemical substances. Um, That's why we avoid having acids on our skin. Uh, we talked about hydrochloric acid on the last slide. Uh, we said that it's in your stomach and it helps dissolve foods well. If you've ever been really nauseous before, you have to throw up over and over again, and your throat starts to feel really raw and sore, and it's because that hydrochloric acid is corrosive and it is destroying the tissue in your throat, and that's what makes it hurt really bad. Our fourth bullet point is that limus paper turns red. So if we had to give um, acid a color, it would be red, y'all. Acid equals red. Our fifth bullet point is that acids react with metals to form hydrogen gas. 
Uh, we've done this a bunch of times in class. When we start to put zinc, aluminum, or magnesium metals in hydrochloric acid, they bubble and give off gas. That gas, y'all, is always hydrogen gas or H2. The next bullet is that aqueous solutions of acids are electrolytes. I don't want you guys to write the entire statement. All I want you guys to write down is that acids are electrolytes. That's the key word there. And it's because they have mobile or free ions, the free hydrogen ion and whatever negative ions uh, that was released or broken down by water. Those charged particles or ions uh, have the ability to move around in that solution and their ability to move around allows them to conduct electricity. So as long as acids are dissolved in water, they are considered electrolytes. And the last bullet point is that we're going to have acid react with base to form two really important products. The first product is water and the second product is salt. So acids react with bases to form water and salt. And so that's the last bullet point you should write down word for word. A natural indicator is a substance that changes colors at different pH. We will learn about pHs a little bit later on, but essentially indicators change colors in the presence of acids or bases. We have this blue litmus paper here. This paper has been treated with a natural indicator. Please note that acids and bases are colorless. Um, they just look like water. If you're looking at a clear solution in a beaker and want to identify whether it is an acid or a base, uh, you use a pipette to put a few drops of that solution on blue litmus paper. And if it changes color to red, then we know we have an acid in the beaker. We wrote this property down already that, again, acid equals red. I want you to add one more thing to your box for acids. What we have here is a pH scale. Hoping that most of you have heard of the term pH before. It's a measurement of the number of hydrogen ions in a solution. Um, let's write down that acids have a pH less than 7. Okay, so our bullet point should be acids have a pH less than 7. And an additional statement, you don't have to write this down, but I want you to understand the property. But an additional statement is that the further away the pH is from 7, meaning it's closer to 0, the more acidic a solution is. So a pH of, say, 1 would be more acidic than a pH of 6. So the further we get away from 7, the more acidic a solution is, meaning it has more hydrogen ions. And we can write that down. Further away from 7, more acidic Moving on to the right hand side of the table for bases, we're going to create a bulleted list just like we did for acids. Let's start with our definition. Bases are compounds that produce hydroxide ions when dissolved in water. A hydroxide ion is simply OH chemically combined with a charge of negative 1. So I'm going to write down for my definition, produces OH minus ions in water. That's the definition of base. Base, again, simplified down to produces OH in water. An everyday example, y'all, is sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide, NaOH is what is used to make different types of soaps and shampoo. When we add NaOH to water, water will come in and break this molecule apart, essentially breaking it apart in half. This means we get sodium ion 
and hydroxide ion. A few everyday example of bases would be milk of magnesia. It is used to neutralize stomach acid. It's composed of magnesium hydroxide. And here we have a picture of milk of magnesia. Drain cleaner is essentially another example and is containing this sodium hydroxide that we see. And again, Drano. Let's continue on with our properties. Bases are bitter, while acids are sour. Bases are also slippery. Just think of soap and shampoo. When you put those things on your hands, uh, they're very slippery. The next property is that they turn litmus paper blue. This one is a little easier to remember. B for base, B for blue. Let's see if this part sounds familiar, y'all. Aqueous solutions of bases are electrolytes. And that's exactly what we wrote down for acids. And in fact, we're going to write down the summary here. Bases are electrolytes because they have dissolved ions in solution. Think of that example I gave you on the previous slide. When the sodium hydroxide, that NaOH, dissolves, we were left with positive ions, the positive sodium ion, and we were also left with a negative hydroxide ion. Because NaOH dissolves and forms ions or charged particles, they can conduct a current, also known as electrolytes. Let's see if the next thing sounds familiar as well. Bases react with acids to form water and salt. Let's write that down. Bases reacts with acids to form water and salt. All right, here's a piece of red litmus paper. Litmus paper comes in two colors, is dyed with a specific indicator. You either get the red litmus paper or the blue litmus paper. Bases will turn red litmus paper blue. Remember, bases are colorless. If you add a few drops of colorless base on the red litmus paper as seen below, it will turn the paper blue. Another indicator is called phenothaline. Phenothaline turns purple in the presence of bases. So if you have a colorless solution and you add a few drops of this phenothaline into it, um, which is actually a very, very weak acid, it will turn that solution into a very hot pink magenta color like you guys see here in this picture. I don't want you guys to write either of these things down, but I just want you guys to know that bases turn litmus paper blue. And the last thing that you'll add for properties of bases is that they have pH that is greater than seven. Again, bases have a pH greater than seven. The further away a pH is from this neutral 7, the more basic or the stronger that base will be. So a pH of 14 right here, y'all, is much stronger than a pH of 10. So the further away we get from this neutral 7, the stronger that base becomes. So further away from seven stronger the base. Now, I want you to take a look right underneath the box where you just listed your properties of acids and bases. You'll see a title that says neutralization reactions with an arrow. Now, there's not a lot of room here, so I recommend that you write above the arrow and leave yourself some room beneath the arrow 
in order to write an example down. So what is this neutralization? This is going to be the third time that you guys are writing this down, y'all. It's very important. It is. Acid plus base yields salt plus water. That arrow, y'all, represents yields, meaning to produce or create. Again, I would leave a little space underneath for an example of what this neutralization reaction would look like. This reaction is a double replacement, y'all. Remember, we did this type of reaction at the very beginning of this semester. We watched the Flintstone video, and in that video, it demonstrated the double replacement by putting in two couples at a dance, and by the end of the dance, they swap partners. We use a phrase inside-outside in order for us to determine the two new products. So let's start with my inside. So we have Na coming from my base. The Na is a positive metal, y'all. And we have the Cl, which is a negative ion, coming from my acid. If we put the positive first, and the rule is positive always goes first if we are writing a chemical formula, and we are, so Na goes first, Cl goes second, we have our salt, sodium chloride. Now the outsides. We have HOH making my water molecule. The H coming from my acid. Remember y'all, acids donates or releases hydrogen ions in solution, whereas the OH comes from the base. Uh, when bases release uh, hydrogen ions, they release it in solution. Here's what I like you guys to do. Underneath acid plus base, yield salt and water, I want you to put the example you see. HCl is an example of my acid. NaOH is an example of my base. NaCl is the example of my salt. And water is simply H2O or HOH. I think it will be easy to write water as HOH here, y'all. The products of a neutralization reaction are always going to be a salt, a metal plus nonmetal, and water. And in this unit, y'all, again, I'm repeating myself, but it's very crucial. It helps if you write water as H-O-H. Either way is fine, y'all. It doesn't matter. But I, for this unit with acids and bases, I would want you guys to write water as H-O-H. I just want to do one more just to make sure you understand the concept. We're going to write the balanced chemical equation for the neutralization reaction between nitric acid and that's HNO3. Notice that it starts with the letter H. This is a pretty good indicator that we have an acid here. Potassium hydroxide, which is KOH. Notice that my base ends with the letters OH. This is a pretty good indicator that we're working with a base. So if I want to predict my products, I'm going to use the inside-outside method. So let's do that. Again, I'm going to start with my inside first. So I have my K, which is my positive, my NO3, which is my negative, and if I were to put those two together with my positive ion going first, I would get KNO3. Notice y'all, potassium has a positive one charge and NO3 nitrate has a negative one charge. If we put them together, the charges cancel out. There are no subscripts. We just write it as KNO3. Next, we go to our outsides and I'm going to color this green. We have my OH and H. So HOH combines to make water. So again, it's easy to write HOH if we are going to have to balance it. So I'm going to rewrite this as HOH. And again, this is our formula. So we have to use the inside outside. Again, we have to balance the equation, and guess what? This equation is already balanced. 
So to clear it up for y'all, if you guys are wanting to write this example down, here you go. But again, it's just an extra one, so you don't need to write it down. Now we're going to move to the top right hand side of your graphic organizer. You'll see one big bicep sitting there in that corner and the title says strengths of acids and bases. We're going to start by writing a definition of what exactly does it mean by strength or how strong an acid or base is. So strong acids and bases completely dissociate in solution to form ions. So that's the key there. I'm going to be underlining the key words here. So strong, y'all, simply means completely dissociate to form ions. In other words, they exist as ions in solution. A strong acid or base simply dissolves completely when you put the acid or base in water. I want you to take a look at the beakers that you guys see over here on the left hand side, specifically uh, this beaker here. Notice how all of the particles are completely separated. So if I have this acid, HA, I'm going to write it in a different color, I have this acid H A. To draw this out, I would have one blue representing my H and then one purple representing my A. Uh, they would exist as a set or a pair that you see there. I just drew it. Um, but when the strong acid is added to water, the water comes in and completely separates it. So I'm going to illustrate this with this light blue water comes in breaks it apart into two separate entities we are going to write down for our definition for strong to mean they dissolve completely or they release really large quantities of ions to solution if strong means to completely dissolve that must mean that a weak acid or base only slightly dissolves. So again, slightly dissolve for weak. So let's take a look at our beaker over here on the right hand side. So the one I didn't circle. What's the most significant difference between these two beakers? The one on the right in terms of ionizing you can only see one green particle that exists on its own and only one blue that exists on its own. I'm going to be circling it in purple to help you guys see that. Again, one blue and one green. The rest are still combined, y'all. Okay, so that's what it means. They're still a set. That's what uh, weak means they did not dissolve completely. Uh, water was not able to go in and break those apart, so it's considered to be a weak base. So let's write that definition down. Weak acid or weak base dissolve to a small extent or only dissolves a little bit. Any way you want to say that, okay? Again, weak acid or base dissolve to a small extent or only dissolves a little bit. It's important to note the identity of our strong acids and bases. So you'll see a spot there for you to list your six strong acids. I want you to list them as HCl, hydrochloric acid, HBr, hydrobromic acid, HI, which is hydroiodic acid, HNO3, nitric acid, HClO4, perchloric acid, and finally, last but not least, H2SO4, sulfuric acid. A reminder, strong simply means that they dissolve completely. It doesn't mean it's 
like indicates danger okay there are plenty of weak acids that are very very corrosive and very very dangerous strong for this unit simply means that it dissolves completely can't stress that enough for strong bases the group is actually much bigger but easier to remember we're going to write down that strong bases are any group one or group two metal on the periodic table with an OH at the end of the formula. So I want you to look at your periodic table and anything that falls under group one alkali metal or group two an alkaline earth metal with OH at the end of the formula, like the examples that are listed down for you, they would be strong bases. I didn't list all of them, but you can figure it out by looking at the periodic table. One last thing to do is to fill out the bottom of your graphic organizer on the left hand side. You'll see a box that says Arrhenius theory. We're going to define acids and bases using the Arrhenius theory, and we're going to make these definitions as easy as possible. So an acid according to Arrhenius, is a compound that starts with the letter H, meaning that it will produce hydrogen ions, or what we call hydronium ions, when dissolved in water. Okay, so hydronium ions simply is H3O+. Plus. Uh, label it here for you, hydronium ion. So to summarize, an Arrhenius acid starts with an H. Let's write an example down. Here we have hydrochloric acid. We wrote this down before, but I didn't write the water. We just assumed that hydrochloric acid was being submerged in water, but notice what happens here, y'all. If I were to donate my hydrogen to H2O, it becomes H3O with a positive charge and chloride ion is all by itself. You'll see that again, we don't use hydronium a lot in our class. We're simply going to write it as H plus. So what we wrote down earlier is true. Also, we're going to eliminate water from this equation as well and it's easier to see the dissociation. So if I were to take off the water molecule, this would simply become H plus, and you see that here, okay? If I don't have H2O, then HCl splits up in half to become H plus and Cl minus. An Arrhenius base, y'all, must contain OH, okay, or hydroxide ions when dissolved in water. For our base definition, again, we can simply reduce what I just said to base equals a compound that ends in OH. And we have our example here. NaOH splits into sodium and hydroxide ions okay again a special note at the bottom dissociation reactions can be written with or without water in the equation unfortunately the Arrhenius definition excludes several compounds from correctly being classified as acids or bases so we need a better definition I don't need you to write down any of these disadvantages. I just want you guys to know because it's not the best definition and it incorrectly labels some substances or omits some substances that we need a better definition. And so we do. The last thing we're going to do for today, I promise you, is to fill out the definition of the bronsted lowry theory. But before we do that, I want to cover something with you really quickly. I want to analyze a neutral hydrogen atom for a subatomic part, meaning I want to know the number of protons, electrons, and neutrons. Okay? So, because 
hydrogen has an atomic number of one, if I were to look at its nucleus, I would expect to find one proton, a positive charge inside the nucleus. And because it's neutral, I know that there's one electron flying around that nucleus. For the neutrons, again, since there's only one proton and there's no need to act as a buffer inside the nucleus to prevent the protons from flying apart or escaping the nucleus, we don't have any neutrons. So if a neutral hydrogen atom were to convert into a hydrogen ion, what would we see? So again, this positive charge simply means that it's losing an electron. So the electron is lost and all I have left is a single proton and that is what a hydrogen ion is. Hydrogen ion is simply a single proton. I want you guys to write this down, y'all. Super important. I want to write it down next to the definition in the box on the bottom right where you see Bronsted Larry. Okay? Again, a hydrogen ion is the same thing as a proton. So, with that said, let's take a look at the Bronsted Lowry. So bronsted Lowry acid is any substance that can donate a hydrogen ion. And we can simply write this down as a bronsted Lowry acid is a proton donor. All right, that's all I want you guys to write. Write bronsted Lowry acid equals proton donor. For a bronsted Lowry base is any substance that can accept a hydrogen ion. And so we're going to write down bronsted Lowry base equals a proton acceptor. There is a very, very cool mnemonic device here that we can use to help remember the bronsted Lowry theory. And it is that acid and bases are bad. So base accepts, acid donates. Okay, so base accepts, proton, acid donates proton. So you'll never, ever, ever, ever have to difficulty uh, remembering this. Acid and bases are bad. Again, base accept proton, acid donates proton. Let's solidify this with an example, y'all. Again, we want to be able to identify the bronsted Lowry acid and bronsted Lowry base. So how we're going to do this is that we're going to start by looking at HCl and determine based on the bronsted Lowry definition whether it is an acid or a base. According to bronsted Lowry, we need to look at the before, and I'm going to label it right here, before and the after. And again, by after, I mean what happens on the product side, and I just labeled it for y'all. Uh, so what has HCl become? So I'm going to draw an arrow to illustrate that. So I'm going to circle HCl, and I'm going to try to trace it over. And an easy way to do this is always to look at the thing that's not an H. So that will be Cl. I'm looking at Cl over here, and I note that there's no longer an H, and that that H has been donated. So by looking at our definition, we know that, again, since that proton was donated, or the H was donated, that this HCl is my bronsted Lowry acid, okay? So we're going to do the same thing with the uh, H2O. I'm going to see what happens on the after. So I'm going to circle it with a different color, H2O, look at the after. So it looks like that H2O gained another H, or it accepted another proton. So this means by our definition that it is a proton acceptor, thus it is a bronsted Lowry base, okay? Bronsted Lowry base and Bronsted Lowry base accepts an H.
So again, this is super duper crucial, y'all. Um, all we have to do as a summary is to take a look at a snapshot of before and a snapshot of after and compare what happened to the H, what happened to the H. And if we want to write that down, let's write it down. So the key here to determine, I'll write it in orange. The question you have to ask yourself is, what happened to the H? There you have it. If you want to identify a bronsted lary acid or base, all you have to do is look at the before and after, and again, ask the question, what happened to the H? Hope you guys learned a lot today. This is Mr. Trans signing out. Have a good one.